Hello. This is the second lecture for MEC 307 uh, Spring 2024. And today's topic is polymers. I'm going to be talking about uh, the distinguish, distinguishing characteristics between two of the major kinds of polymers, thermoplastics and thermosets, two of the most uh, common ways that polymers are synthesized. Um, I'm going to talk about the effect of the composition of a polymer on its properties, uh, the crystallinity of a polymer, uh, its molecular weight, and then just a bit about be polymer behavior. Okay, we're back here. Um, uh, this image at the top here is of a thermoplastic. Um, there's individual chains, and they uh, have an arrow here at one of them. But there, there's, for example, um, let's see, this chain is wound around another chain. And each of them is referred to as a monomer, one um, length, one chain. And all of these chains are tangled up with one another and so if the temperature is lower, they're going to have less mobility. They're going to kind of be sticky. They're not going to be willing to give up um, their place. And so that the, the polymer will be more rigid. And as the temperature goes up, then the um, atoms are more mobile. They're, more, um, they're vibrating more. And each of the chains can slip past one another. So thermoplastics will change in their rigidity with temperature. The image at the bottom is of a thermoset. They have the same long chains, but they are at certain points bound to one another by a covalent bond. And you'll remember the covalent bond is very strong. So we have these covalent bonds along the length of the chain, but we also have covalent bonds that are between chains. And so the individual chains do not have the freedom to slide past one another. And so thermosets, are rigid at any temperature. You can't soften them and reform them with heat. Most of the polymers, as we move toward, hopefully, more uh, of the uh, choice for polymers that can be recycled, um, thermoplastics can be reformed into a shape and remade into something else and recycled, whereas thermosets since they're solid that can't um, flow, or on, can only be ground up and used as a, as a filler. Okay. So next, <clears throat> the next thing I wanna talk about are the two ways that polymers are synthesized. The first of those it is a process called addition polymerization. In addition polymerization, individual molecules, and say of ethane, bind up and, and add on to the ends of chains. So a chain grows by individual units adding onto the end. Hence the name addition polymerization. And a, one of the biggest groups of, of um, addition polymers are vinyls, which uh, we're illustrating here. So the image on the left is polyethylene. It's just a series of CH2 groups. This N is a measure of how many of those groups uh, are in one chain. If I attach, instead of all hydrogens, if I attach a CH3 group, then now I have polypropylene. That's the difference between the two. If instead I attach a benzene ring, like that, that's polystyrene. And you can imagine that individual chains sliding past one another, it would be more difficult for that to happen if that's a benzene ring than if I had just a hydrogen. And so that's why polystyrene is a more stiff, um, brittle material. PVC we know of as, as a, a plumbing material. Um, and in that case, 
I just have a chlorine, but this is maybe deceiving because the chlorine atom is much larger than the hydrogen atom. So it's similar to polystyrene, that poly PVC is more stiff than say polyethylene or polypropylene. Um, polytetrafluoroethylene, PTFE, is also known more commonly as Teflon. And I have fluorine atoms instead of hydrogen atoms along the length, which are very slippery and contribute to the properties of Teflon. This is PDA, so often used in glue. And now um, I have, this is a CH and a CH2. And then here I've got this acetate. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to require you to know all these chemical um, molecules. I'm just showing these to you to, to get a sense of how large this constituent group is on the chain, because that affects the properties. And then acrylic, I've got a CH3 at one of the um, carbons in this carbon-carbon unit. But then at the other side, I have this large methacrylate addition. And again, that causes polymethyl methacrylate or acrylic to be much more stiff. The other kind of uh, uh, polymer synthesis is condensation polymerization. In condensation polymerization, there are two different components and with a catalyst and sometimes heat, they're brought together and a small molecule is removed, causing them to bind to one another. So here we have polycarbonate. We have the first component here And then the second component here, and then this chlorine would bind with this hydrogen from the next chain, and two, they would come together and they would give off two HCl molecules. That's, uh, that would be polycarbonate for things like nylon the small molecule that's produced is water, H2O. And that's why this is, these are called condensation polymers because they produce water, some of them produce water. Now, the, the thing about this is for condensation polymers, whatever this, whatever this uh, molecule is that's a product needs to be removed to keep the, keep the reaction going. So the drawback of condensation polymers is if you put them in an environment where that molecule is present, the reaction can go in the reverse direction. And so you, some of you, if you work with nylon, know that it's important to keep nylon in a dry environment, especially if there's heat, because if water is present with nylon, the reaction can go in the opposite direction and you could go back to having the two separate components and, wa and uh, taking up that water um, it, and breaking down the polymer, essentially. So whatever this, for condensation polymers, whatever that molecule is that's a product has to be removed during synthesis and it should not be present in the service environment. Okay. Now, uh, the composition of polymers can have a lot to do with the properties. Uh, many polymers in the backbone have only carbon. Um, some have hydrogen. Um, actually, this should be a nitrogen. Nitrogen and oxygen in the backbone. So let's look at uh, what, that, what that implies. 
So we've looked at these vinyls already, right? Carbon, carbon along the backbone. And individual monomers link up. So polyethyl for polyethylene, these are all hydrogens. For polypropylene, three of them are hydrogens. For polystyrene, three are hydrogens. And the other is a benzene ring. So these are all carbons on this ring and each has two hydrogens. So it's a very large component. Uh, polyvinyl chloride, I have a chlorine and then all hydrogens. So these are vinyls and, the, and, and polyethylene, they're all formed by addition poly polymerization. So over time, as, a, as the um, polymerization proceeds, I'm gonna end up with, if I have polyethylene, I'm gonna end up with long chains of carbon as each of those units is added to the end and, and, and they have hydrogen at, along their length. So vinyls have um, only carbon along the backbone. Polyesters have oxygen in the backbone. So does polycarbonate, which we looked at earlier. Oxygen is bound twice, whereas carbon in the backbone has, every carbon has four bonds. So the things that are added on the side of a carbon chain make it Less, un, less able to um, form a spiral or a helix or bend in general. Whereas oxygen, this molecule can bend, or these two ends can bend around this oxygen bond quite a bit. And that would allow this polymer, the polyesters, to be able to rearrange or untangle if a uh, stress is applied. Nitrogen, something in between carbon and oxygen. Nitrogen has three bonds. And so this molecule, this is um, nylon, um, this molecule isn't as flexible as the polyesters, but it's more flexible than the vinyl. And that contributes to the properties. Okay, now if we're thinking about, now we've thought, of, let, let's say we're past um, uh, making decisions about what is in the backbone. And now we're looking at how individual molecules are arranged with respect to one another. This is a function or something that would be called crystallinity in a polymer. Now. Crystallinity in general means that there's a repetitive, consistent arrangement of atoms in space. So it could mean that I've got, say, carbon in a cubic arrangement through space. That would be a form of an order of carbon, carbon being in an ordered um, arrangement. Um, in the case of polymers, it's not that ordered. In the case of polymers, <clears throat> I will have, let's say I've got a given polymer chain and it's kind of random in space. And then there's a region where the polymer chain, this long molecule, can fold on itself. And if I am able to expand that and look at, say, just this, I would see an ordered arrangement of carbon or carbon oxygen or, or whatever. And it's really just only because this polymer was able to 
fold back and forth on itself like that. This would be the crystalline part of the polymer and this would be the amorphous part of the polymer. And it's rare that the amount of crystalline part of the polymer is you know, bigger than say 20% um, with some exceptions. It's usually pretty small. And so a polymer that has some crystalline component is termed a semi-crystalline polymer. Whereas a polymer that has no order or arrangement of, of the carbon bonds would be technically called an amorphous polymer. So here's an image that sort of um, shows this difference. Uh, an amorphous polymer um, has, because there's no order, there will be no melting temperature. There will be a change in viscosity with temperature. In other words, as I heat that polymer up, it will get less and less viscous and get to a point of flowing, but not at one temperature. A semi-crystalline polymer will have sort of a distinct temperature, which we would call a melting temperature, at which there's a distinct change in viscosity and properties. So uh, if I'm processing these two polymers, amorphous polymer, let's say I'm, uh, let's say I'm blow molding it uh, with an amorphous polymer. Um, I just need to tweak the temperature to the point where I have a viscosity that's not too thin that would allow the polymer just sort of to run without control, but, but not too thick as so the polymer wouldn't flow, but I could dial that in. With a semi-crystalline polymer, I, there is a temperature at which the polymer will go from solid to liquid as far as its behavior. And if that's my process temperature, then that can be really tricky to mold. That polymer can be really tricky to mold. Also, if I'm in service near the temperature um, at which it, the, the, this order occurs, um, I can have a change in shape, um, which typically would be something like uh, warp at that temperature where maybe it's not as crystalline as it could be and the material itself sort of shrinks a bit as the crystalline region forms. Um, but as far as tolerance and size, um, semi-crystalline polymer might be problematic. Property-wise, these crystalline regions offer a lot more strength and resistance to mechanical deformation than the random chains do. So if I am uh, wanting to make something out of a polymer and I'm, uh, I'm getting ready to order the pellets that I'm going to heat up and mold into a specific shape, the, the uh, vendor will offer me different molecular weight um, polymers uh, for, for my application. And if I want a lot of good uh, resistance to mechanical deformation, I want that molecular weight to be pretty high. What is that molecular weight? What, is, what do I mean by the molecular weight? Well, it's a function of the size of the polymers. So if I have a, a polymer um, sample, there will be parts of that sample where the average length of the chains is say 100,000 units long. And there might be part of the polymer where the average length of the chains is maybe half of that. Um, and so I, I, I'm, gonna ha I'm gonna purchase this polymer. It's gonna have a distribution, a range of polymer sizes. The average of that, whatever the average is, that is, often called the molecular weight because it's the best way of, dis of uh, describing this distribution of, of sizes. The polydispersity, we'll get to in a second, um, is a measure of how broad that distribution is. So we can um, now I don't Okay, I don't know why I have this blank one. But in, in essence, as the molecules get longer, uh, longer, 
larger molecules. I will have molecules like this, and for the shorter, I might, in the extreme, have molecules like that. They have the same makeup along the length, but this one on the left, there's more of those individual units in a row than the, for the um, polymer on the right. Now, the, if we're, we're, ta we're talking here about thermoplastics in general, if I have um, a lot of long chains or an average lot of long chains, they're going to be more tangled in one another than a lot of short chains. And if they're more tangled, then they're going to be more resistant to stress than these will. These really aren't interacting with one another at all, and so they'll slip right past one another when a load is applied. So the larger, longer, longer molecules have more resistance to mechanical stress. And hence, probably better prop properties. And so I need to be mindful of what the mechanic, or sorry, what the molecular weight is of a polymer when I order it, when I order pellets from which I'm going to make a, a component, a part. And not surprisingly, the longer, the, 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 the larger the molecular weight distribution, the larger the average molecular weight for a polymer, the more the cost, because it's going to have more um, stiffness, more ability to resist deformation. So here's an example of that effect. And oh, all right, uh, now I understand what I just did. Um, apologize here. This uh, is actually the same, si same slide with the image added. Um, here's molecular weight in the x-axis. And as that increases, we can see this is tensile strength, the blue line increases. Once, once we get to a super high molecular weight, then there's not as much increase with molecular weight, not, not as much increase in strength. The green line is the viscosity of the melt, and that can be important if I need to um, move the polymer through a die and into a, some kind of a, a shape. And impact resistance has a similar curve, that's the red one, similar curve to um, strength. Okay, so um, what I want to do now is talk about how we could describe the um, size, the average size. So if, if we have a random process as far as polymerization uh, goes, we will have something close to a normal distribution of sizes. So um, I've put this into a format that looks like columns, and it, I, it means that this is the number of molecules. I have only this number, whatever that is, of molecules that are that size. So say this is 10,000 um, uh, grams or, or atomic mass units or something, but, it, but, the, but it's, it's 10. And let's say that for the polymers that are 20 units long, I've got twice as many, and so on. So I've got, let's say, so I'm going to kind of guess at this, maybe this is two molecules, and then twice that four, and then maybe nine, and then maybe uh, 12. This is N, the number of molecules for, of each of the different sizes. And this is molecular weight, MW for the I, for each of those groups. Uh, often the process is not random and there's not a normal distribution. And the um, distribution, instead of being normal like this, is weighted one way or another. 
So comparing this and this distribution, the average, if it were determined by the highest point here, is pretty much the same, but one distribution is much more narrow than the other. The value of low molecular weight molecules is that it allows for um, lubricity. It, it, uh, it, 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 uh, they're, they're, the small molecules allow for flow of the uh, polymer into a tool. So low molecular weight um, aid in processing. And the high molecular weight molecules provide the, the, the strength. So a broad distribution like this one here um, would offer me an ease in processing and maybe some more resistance to deformation. A narrow distribution like this one will be more homogeneous. And then we'll have sometimes uh, a non-normal non, uh, distribution where it's tipped toward the low molecular weight or the high molecular weight molecules. So calculating an average. Uh, the mean of, uh, or the uh, mathematical average, if I had, um, if I had molecules and I broke them into groups, uh, the, those that have 10 units, those that have 20, 30, 40, 50, and so on, and counted them. And so I found that I had two molecules that were 10 units long. So this is N sub I, the number of molecules, and MW sub I, the weight of those molecules. I could count up all the total number of molecules. So two plus four plus nine and so on. Six, 15, 28, 46, 66, 78, 85, I believe. That would be the sum of n sub i. So if that's a total of 85 molecules, and I want to find the average size of the molecules, I could calculate, I could, add, I could take each individual molecule times its weight, adding them all up, and then dividing by the number of molecules. That's the average, right? I could put them in groups and maybe speed that up. So I've got two molecules that are 10 units long. That would, they together would be, have a, a weight, a total weight for that group of 20. Two that are each 10 has a total weight, that's this W sub I, of 20. And continuing on down, this group of 20 unit long, um, polymers has a total weight of 80, so about 270, about 400, 520, um, 800, 1,200, 80, 840, 400, and 180. So that's th this is the mass of each individual group, right? If I could add up all of the weights of all of them together and divide it by the total number of them, then I could have um, an arithmetic average or a mean. So let's see. So I calculate that the total mass of all of these, the total weight, 
is 4,680 units. So if I take that number and divide it by the total number of units, I get that the average or the mean um, is 46.80 divided by 85, and that's equal to 55. So someplace right in there. So that's one way of calculating the molecular weight of a polymer. And it's called the number average molecular weight. Take the, the total N sub I, MW sub I, divided by the total N sub I. And as I said before, the number times the molecular weight in any group is the weight of that group, W, uh, w sub I. So the number average molecular weight is equal to the sum of W sub I over the sum of N sub I. It's also equal to the same um, N sub, sum of N sub I, w, MW sub I over N sub I. These two equations are both true. The other um, type of measurement for molecular weight is called the weight average molecular weight. Polymer behavior is more influenced by the heavier molecules than the lighter molecules. So if we calculate a weight average molecular weight, we'll have a better description of the behavior of a polymer. And so I take the sum of W sub I, MW sub I, divided by the sum of W sub I. And this breaks that down further. And we'll do an example of that so you can see how this works. So let's say I have this normal distribution. I've got four molecules that are 10 units long. I've got 10 molecules that are 20 units long, and so on. So I'll set up a table like this. Here's each of the number of molecules for each of the sizes. And like, um, like we did with uh, the previous example, I'm going to calculate the product of each for each group and put it in this third col column. <clears throat> and then I'll sum that column and I'll sub sum M N sub I like this. So this is the sum of all of the total number of molecules and this is the sum of the weights of all of the molecules. And so the number average molecular weight is going to be 19,885 divided by 281.5 here. And that value is 70.6 or 71 units. And that, well, this is just the same thing again. Here's where it is on the chart. As we kind of would predict, if I've got a normal distribution, the number average is going to be right there in the center. Okay? As I mentioned, there's another way of calculating the average molecular weight, and that, that is weighted heavier weighted more to the heavier molecules. And so it adds a column to the, um, the numbers that we had before. So these were the W sub I values. This was 40, um, 200, 480, and so on. Uh, wait. 
Oops, sorry, that's not 480. That's Five forty. Okay. I'm not going to complete this. I just want to give enough. Well, I guess we do probably need these numbers. So in each of these cases, I've now got the number of molecules that weigh 10 units and the mass or weight of them all, W squared. So what I'm going to do with that number is I'm going to multiply it again by the molecular weight. So that this would be 40 times 10. And this would be 200 times 20. and 540 times 30. So this, this total number of molecules was 281.5, and the total weight of all of the molecules was 19,885 units. And so if I completed that table and I added all of the W sub I times M W sub I, if I added that column, I would get 1,623,750. So the sum of W sub I over the sum of n sub i, that was the number average molecular weight. The weight average molecular weight is going to be the sum of w sub i m w sub i divided by the sum of w sub i. So I would take the one, two, three, fourth column sum and divide it by the third column sum. And sorry, I'm covering up. So that is equal to 81.7. Okay. And if I look at that on the
So I've got another example here to do. In this case, this is not a normal distribution. The distribution is weighted toward the smaller molecules. I set up my uh, table the same way to calculate the sum of n sub i dot m w sub i. So for each group, this would be 110. This would be uh, 560. Three times, I'm sorry, 30 times 49, 1440, on down. The sum of all the total of all the molecules, in this case, if you add them all up, is 432. And if we were to add up the sum of all the weights of each group, we would get, I don't have that calculated. Looks like it will be two, five, nine, six. That does not seem right. Give me one second, I'll, I'll calculate this for you. Um, these values, let's see, uh, 2320, um, 3000. 3,300, 28, oh, sorry, 32, 90, 28, 80, 90 times 25 is 2,700, 100 times 12, this is a different set of numbers then. Hmm. Okay, the next slide is going to show us that these values, they are not correct. They are based on a different distribution. So give me one second. Uh, what would be best? I think what would be the best way to move forward here so that the slides are all consistent. And I apologize if you've already done all this math, but we're going to, I'm going to use a different set of n sub i values so that it matches subsequent screens. And so I want to change these values. This is going to be 12. This is going to be 28. 48. 58. That's 60. 55. 47. 36. Thirty. This is going to be twenty-five. This is going to be sixteen. This is going to be eleven, and this is going to be six. Okay, so if we use those numbers instead, and this is one twenty. This is, that's where that 560 came from. Uh, 30 times 48 is, um, that's 1440. 40 times 58 is 2320. 
50 times 60 is still 3,000. 60 times 55, 3,300. 70 times 47, 3,290. 80 times 36, 2880. 30 times 90, 2700. 25 times 100, 2500. 16 times 110, 1760. 120 times 11, 1320. 130 times 6 is 780. Okay, this sum is 432. Now that we've changed those numbers. And the sum of all of the molecular weights Uh, to 25,970. And so the number average, M sub N, the number average molecular weight is going to be 25,970 divided by 432. And that gives me a number average molecular weight of 60.1. Notice I don't ever calculate the sum of each of these molecular weight groupings. To get the weight average molecular weight, I've got to take this third column and multiply it by um, the number average molecular weight again. So I've got weight average, that's this column, times MW sub I, this one. So the, this fourth column is going to be the third column times the second column. So this is 1,200. Uh, 20 times 560, 112. 30 times 1440, 4, 3, 200, 40 times 2320, 92, 800, and so on. And the sum of all those should be 1898407 and also the weight average this number average molecular weight note is 
the sum of n sub i m w sub i divided by the sum of n sub i. The weight average of molecular weight is going to be the sum of w sub i m w sub i over the sum of w sub i. So that's the total, the sum of the fourth column divided by the sum of the third column. 1, 8, 9, 8, 4, 0, 7 divided by 2, 5, 9, 7, 0. And that ends up being 73.3. All of those numbers are included in the next slide. So what does that look like? Here's my number average. And here's my weight average. Oops. Number average molecular weight and weight average. Weight, again, weight average molecular weight is always greater. And I already mentioned before, polydispersity index is the measure of how broad the distribution is. Normally, if it's a random distribution, uh, a random polymerization, nothing fancy, not weighted, the polydispersity index will be around two. It could be as high as eight. If all the molecules in a polymer are all the same length, then M N a number average molecular weight would equal the weight average molecular weight. So all the molecules would be the same size, which is pretty theoretical. It's called a mono monodispersed polymer. Okay, we're closing in on the end of the presentation. So the behavior of a polymer is gonna be a function of the amorphous region. Uh, this allows for the chains to stretch and uncoil. So that is elastic deformation. The amorphous region will give us elastic deformation. The crystalline region will resist plastic deformation, the extent of Plastic deformation will be controlled by the crystalline region. So a typical um, stress strain curve. I've got a, a molecule or a polymer that looks like that. You see that there's regions of crystalline material. And between those are regions of random amorphous material. So um, when I first start to apply stress, the amorphous material is, is that which it's giving. Those chains are strengthening, it's stretching. If they have a coil, then they're uncoiling. And all of that is elastic. If I take the stress away, it'll go back to the original length. And continue to stress and I get into the yielding and the ultimate tensile strength. And at that point, I'm, I've, got, I've already reached my maximum deformation in the amorphous region. Now the, um, crystalline region, they start to shift past one another. That's permanent deformation. And as that proceeds, this unit will start to break into individual strands. Now we see that, that there, there's a literal shift or break between parts of the crystalline region. And finally, they will literal, literally be separate strands. And if, you, if, you've if you've observed polymer deformation, you might have seen 
uh, this is our your last step where it looks like individual fibers that are being stressed okay all right so that's it for this lecture on polymers and we'll do an example of calculating molecular weight in class thanks <laughs>